That's how I would summarize that. Um, maybe one day that will change, but I, personally I think that um, we're better off evolving ourselves since uh, we don't need the middleman of the computer to come between us and our capacity for thinking and creativity. Um, I mean, what about the 2045 agenda? You mentioned us becoming cyborgs. That's the 2045 agenda wants us to be in those computers. Yeah. As I, avatars. I think whether that's possible or not is debatable. You may end up having some elements of the consciousness of a being put in, inserted into a system, but without the actual electromagnetic essence of the being that you can call a soul being involved, then really it's just a copy. Um is it possible to take the electromagnetic soul essence of a being and somehow systematize it and put it into a computer? Um, maybe, I don't know, but um, I would like to think that humanity was smart enough to um, direct itself towards more, uh, let's say, safe and reliable options for evolution <laughs> than, than doing that. And I think what it really comes down to is, even if there are some people who want to take humanity in that direction, we all have free will, and that's really the key, is, is our free will. And if you look at the most corrupting forces on the planet and the most evil forces on the planet, they're always trying to override free will. They're always trying to find ways to get us to give up our free will. Um, and it's gotten to the point where there are, I regularly talk to people who actually deny that free will even exists. They're convinced that it doesn't exist. And I say to them, well, will is you doing something. If you breathe or you move your arm into a position, anything, that's an action of your will, so it must exist. And then they'll come up and say, well, all these different explanations, mental gymnastics to say why that isn't true. But from my perspective, I choose to do something, I will it, and therefore I have will, and that's that. And, and my will can be controlled, which means it's not free will anymore, it's just will, or I can allow my will to be completely free, and, and then I'm gonna be basically quite empowered and, um, and able to be more of who I really wanna be. And if you look at um, the political, governmental, even scientific, judicial, education systems, nearly all of them, all of them really, are heavily skewed towards suppressing will of other people. And, and the will is very much connected into emotionality and the feminine side of our, of our essence. So that's why, in a sense, it's alarming when you see, or when I see, um, Scientists attempting to remove all emotion from their work or, or, law, or also in the court system as if that's going to somehow result in a more truthful outcome. But if a significant amount of the information you need is coming from your emotions, then you're going to automatically be hindering yourself in your ability to know what's true. And, and that's literally what I see happening. So um, it is true that your emotions can mislead you and maybe draw you off into an avenue of thinking which isn't helpful, but that's where the heart comes in, which is to say that the heart balances the thoughts and the emotions together so that you can actually gain the insight from emotion from the feminine side and the useful thought processes from the masculine side and bring them together in a balanced, coherent way. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> there's no way to, to mimic that through technology, and I think as long as those who choose to survive basically is how I would put it those who choose to ha have free will um, and to be the strongest and best version of themselves as a human and beyond as long as they choose to maintain their respect and increase their respect for their emotions and their own heart they're going to be okay pretty much um, those who become cyborgs probably not so much uh, that's my prediction I don't like making predictions but I would say in this case that's to me it's fairly clear but um, so, yeah, I mean, I could talk about technology for a long, long time, but that's, to me, that's, that's one part of my life, and um, other parts of my life, to me, are more interesting, really. Uh, so, I mentioned Rage Against the Machine, bringing music back into the subject, so um, I've always made music for a long time, and I've been to quite a lot of music festivals, met a lot of interesting people, and... What I've come to understand, as other people probably on the basis series have pointed out as well, that is that music is very powerful and connected very much to what we might call paranormal experiences because everything is vibrating all the time, all the atoms are vibrating. 
we are vibrational beings so anything which is a form of vibration is obviously capable of affecting quite a lot in reality and we know that from the fact that music's such a big money-making thing and so many people love music um it just so happens that as it turns out uh, music festivals i've learned apparently are of great interest to let's say some of the more interesting beings around our planet some of whom probably aren't human um and this comes back to why i came into contact with bases in the first place because i've had in my life a couple of contacts with light ships what i call light ships which to me are like plasma vehicles which are they appear to be very very bright light in the sky um, and they'll have a form which could be a geometric shape or some other kind of form and having seen them now twice quite close up they are basically glowing very intense light which i would say is a form of almost matter that's not quite matter so a form of energy that's pre-matter let's say um, and the reason i bring up the music festivals is that the last time i saw one was actually at the reading festival in england um, in 2007 and at that time i thought that it was so obvious and it was so visible and there were thousands of people around me in the crowd i thought wow this is it this is the day that the world realizes that we have these visitors here because it's going to be all these cameras um, and there's no way to hide it and i could I, basically i'd been kind of forewarned by someone online that this was a good time this weekend was going to be an interesting time let's say for these kinds of experiences so i was actually looking up while i was in the crowd and it was it was um the last day of that weekend and it was smashing pumpkins the band were playing who i really liked and i was quite near the front of the crowd and there was sixty thousand people it was a pitch black night with a bright moon and and i was looking up every now and again and I just happened to see this orange light in the sky and I was like, wow, okay, what's that? And it got closer and closer and closer and basically it flew over me and the crowd and it was about, I'd say, it's hard to say, maybe 100 to 200 metres off the ground. And I was screaming and screaming to everyone to get them to look at it, but the music was so loud and the lights were so bright that no one looked. And the only person I saw that looked was my friend who I pointed, pointed you know, grabbed him and pointed him to it. And I looked at his eyes to make sure he was actually looking at it and, and his eyes just glazed over as soon as he looked at it. He went into kind of shock. Um, and Do that you was have a picture or something like that? Yeah, so I can bring it up on the, um, uh, on the slide here. So, so this, this is an interesting story. So, so this picture was taken by a guy from Mexico called Carlos Diaz. Uh, and he, I didn't know about him when I, when I saw this ship. I, didn't, I found out about this documentary that covered his story a few years, up, a few years later didn't really tell many people about my experiences with it because I had no proof for it and you know I'm not I don't really like trying to convince people of things that I can't show any evidence for um, so Carlos Diaz was a as I recall he was a re reporter I think in Mexico out in the countryside and he was driving uh, late at night on a quiet road on his own and he stopped uh, for some reason and he saw this ship in a valley ahead of him and he had his camera with him and he took some pictures of it and it ascended out of the valley and kind of flew away and so he was obviously amazed and shocked and as he gradually processed and integrated those experiences he came to have more and more of them and it got to the point it's quite a long story but it got to the point where uh, he actually was taken on board the ship consciously he would get up at like two or three in the morning while his wife was asleep and consciously go with them and he explained that basically they the Mayan people, because I think he's probably part of the Mayan culture or related to it or close, you know, he's from that part of the world. And at one point, I remember he explained that he was taken to a kind of secret underground cavern, I guess you would call it, um, which the certain members of those tribes have known about for a very long time. And they taught him things, basically. They put him through certain processes and, for example, put him in some sort of energetic sphere or egg-shaped thing which allowed him to experience what it was like to be an eagle for example and he literally was an eagle for that while he was in there so it's very spiritual kind of experiences he was having but um he's a very peaceful kind of quiet guy but when i saw this picture on the internet i was my you know i was just so happy i was kind of like wow that's i couldn't almost couldn't believe or accept that i was seeing it because it validated my previous experiences um and when i got back from that festival in reading um I did look up on the internet at that time in the early sort of days of the internet to see if anyone else had reported seeing it 
And one guy or some person had actually reported seeing the same thing I'd seen, but it was 100 miles away from the Reading Festival. Uh, and that was all I heard about it. But as soon as I saw this picture, I knew it was the same vehicle, almost exactly the same colours. And um, the colours change and they move. So obviously that's the static picture we're seeing there. Um, but it's very much alive looking. The light literally looks alive. And there's a certain magnetic nature to it as well. There were actually, when I saw it, there were, I think I counted 13 small white, uh, small white kind of orb type craft around it. Very, very bright as well. And at the, at the time, bearing in mind it was nighttime and I was outside, I, th I thought maybe these were birds and there was a spotlight hitting them. They were that bright. But I thought, well, there aren't any spotlights pointing upwards. So I just kept watching them. And basically they were connected to this other vehicle in some way. And they were moving a bit like a school of fish. So they were kind of magnetically repulsing and attracting each other. Um, and what I saw that night, essentially that those vehicles gradually just moved off over the horizon. And that was that, that was the end of the experience. Um, but for Carlos Diaz, he had many experiences with them and it got to the point where he uh, actually invited or somehow the, a, a Mexican university team was sent down, as I recall. It's been a while since I watched the documentaries, but they, you can watch them on YouTube. Uh, we'll put a link in the in the notes, I guess, or I'll, I'll write a comment linking to them. And uh, the university team essentially came down, and they really, I think, they didn't expect to to have an interaction with <laughs> with an ET or UFO craft or whatever you want to call it. I think they thought it was a hoax, and and basically it manifested sort of out of nothing, just like that, it just appeared. And apparently most of the team just ran off terrified um, because, you know, they weren't really prepared for that. And and a lot of the pictures which he, Carlos, has made were sent apparently to, you can see in the documentary, were sent to a NASA um, photo analyst, also to various Hollywood specialists at the time, using kind of dated equipment now, but um, back then, you know, they, was, they were the top in their fields and they, they analysed these pictures and every single one of them said these are not fake pictures, you know, whatever we're seeing there is a real thing that was taken with this camera. Um, so to my knowledge that's the only time I've ever heard of NASA specialists openly saying, you know, this is definitely a blatantly obvious UFO craft. Um, and I'm just amazed that, you know, not so many people have heard about his case really. It's, it's, to me it's the most amazing, I mean, it's amazing to me because I've seen the same thing but it's, to me, it's the most amazing because it's so detailed and so um, there's a lot of evidence for it. And, you know, real specialists have agreed that there's something there as well. So definitely, if you're into these sort of subjects, go and check out the documentary called Ships of Light, which you can find on, on YouTube. Um, th that actually wasn't the first encounter I'd had with a light ship. Um, I used to make music before I had some injuries to my hearing and... Um, there was a time where I was working with someone who's now um, quite well known in some circles making music and um, we were travelling back from where we were staying back towards London we were driving down the A11 I was driving it was about 11.30 I think if I remember correctly at night dark again and I'd been having unusual experiences for the previous few days very unusual um, to the point where I wasn't even sure if I was sane or going crazy or what was happening. Basically, I it was around the time when I had these spiritual awakening experiences and I started to realize everything's one. And, and essentially, I was so energetic and excited about those understandings that my consciousness expanded and I was telepathing with beings who are not here. And it's not something I'd ever thought about in my whole life and didn't know if it was real or not. And I wasn't ready for it. And basically, I you know, wasn't sure whether I was going crazy or, or if there's something to it or even if I was being messed with by technology in some way. Um, but there's nothing I could do but keep going through the experience. And gradually, more and more kind of strange things kept happening. Um, synchronicities, as I call them now, kind of manifestations, let's say, in physical reality that didn't really have a great explanation except for they were paranormal experiences. And I'm not talking about... Um, you know, ectoplasm or anything like that, but um, just signs and things would occur which made me, which kind of, it was like a prompt to say, yeah, what you're thinking about actually is correct. Um, I'll put it, put it like that. It would take me a long time to explain all this in detail, but the short version is um, I came to understand that I was communicating with ETs 
but thought that that was a bit of a crazy idea and just but I have a very open mind basically I always like to keep my mind open because I know that that's the only way I'm going to get to the truth and I might find I was right I might find I was wrong but um, but anyway we were driving back down the A11 quite close to um, the Bentwaters kind of area about 20 miles away I think um, is it RAF Woodbridge is that the name of it yeah there's uh, there's two, two bases uh, Woodbridge and Bentwaters yeah so so we were, you know, not too far away from there, and I was driving, and I got a shot of energy. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before or since. I got a sho shock of energy up my spine, and it turned my head to the left. So something energetically caused my, my head to turn to the left and up as I was driving. Um, and as soon as my head stopped, I was looking at uh, another plasma ship. It was a triangle shape, um, bright red, very about as bright red as you can imagine, with a orangey underside that was slightly wavy. And it was about the size of a house and it was about 100 metres away and it was above the tree line. And I just started laughing, basically, because I was so stressed from all of these weird experiences I've been having. And to actually see this thing there, it was like, oh, my God, thank you. You know, I'm not going crazy. I might be hallucinating this thing, but at least, you know, <laughs> at least I've got something that I can explore now that isn't just my thoughts. And so I quickly turned to my friend and who was in the passenger seat. And I just started laughing. I said, what do you think that is? And he looked at it. And again, I was watching his eyes to make sure, you know, he was actually focusing on it. And he just became terrified. As soon as he saw it, he just said, drive, you know, shouted, drive. And then I just, you know, I I just started laughing again because I was just so happy that he could see it and, and that this wasn't just a, a delusion I was having and that he was seeing it and it was a real thing. So if I was on my own, I probably would have stopped the car and gone and investigated, but... Um, at that time, that road was a single carriageway, difficult to stop, and he really was uh, um, frightened and wanted me to drive, so I just kept driving. So I've had a few experiences like that, and um, the most interesting thing for me is that the causality, let's say, of those experiences was not just a random chance. It wasn't just me happening to look up and seeing them. It was me having experiences on the ground that led up to that, um, which prepared me for that. And what I learned from Reading Festival, basically, was that you can have 60,000 people in the vicinity of something like this, and most of them aren't going to see it. All right, they were heavily distracted, but the point is, I, th I, I come to understand, really, now, that if you aren't ready for something of that nature, you are going to block it out, or you're just going to turn the other way. Something's going to cause you not not to recognise that it's there. And And although I've never seen ghosts or anything like that, I can relate now more to people who say they've seen them even while other people don't see them because it seems like we have the ability to heavily filter what we perceive in our reality. Um, and I think some people would say, oh, you hallucinated it, you invented it, it's not there because I can't see it. But I think in a certain number of cases, it's just as likely to be the other way around where there are really these kinds of things which a lot of people aren't seeing because they're filtering them out because their belief systems say that's impossible. So therefore, their kind of part of their brain that processes data says that thing I'm sensing can't be real because it doesn't fit in with what I accept is real. So therefore, it erases it. Um, and there's a very interesting book called The Holographic Universe uh, by Michael Tolbert, which talks about subjects like this. And there's some diagrams in there which show you that this your brain is actually doing that. Um, so you can do a little experiment with your eyes and you can actually see that your brain is effectively censoring information in in, um, in an interesting way. So definitely check that book out as well, The Holographic Universe, if you haven't already read it. Um, so all these things together have really taught me a lot about humanity and psychology and um, reality and answered some of my questions about the whole paranormal and UFO kind of agenda or topic because there's so much contradicting information and so many um, different voices with different beliefs and lots of arguments and I think if you understand that everyone has a subjective reality and they have the capacity to filter things out or add things in and totally and utterly accept that that's real that does explain quite a lot of of why people disagree about certain subjects not just in the ET world or a UFO kind of studying realm but just in life in general as well so um, I think there would be a lot less arguments if we all remembered that we all have our own reality basically and, and it's real for us so um, that you know that definitely can can increase the peace if we all <laughs> focused on that a little bit more and kept that in mind instead of you know this whole I'm right you're wrong kind of paradigm 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of continuing on the topic of ETs and UFOs, since that's so relevant to bases, um, after those experiences, I had a lot of questions, understandably, and so I really started looking onto the internet, reading books, looking at everything I could find, and one day somebody pointed me to a character called Bashar on YouTube, and effectively it's spirit channeling, and I didn't know what spirit channeling was, I'd never heard of it, and oh, I think I'd probably heard of it, but I'd never seen it, and I didn't really think it was real, I thought it was a hoax, you know, just a way to make money out of people, but I watched some videos on YouTube of Bashar, which is actually channeled allegedly by Daryl Anker. Well, there's actually 10 or so channels of Bashar, but the one that's best known is uh, Daryl Anker, who, if I remember rightly, is the cousin of Paul Anker, I think, the famous singer. I think that's the right name, maybe not, but um, he used to work as a producer on Star Trek, uh, and so he's been around Hollywood. And his story is basically he had a couple of close encounters with UFOs that led him to study paranormal subjects and he got into channeling and became very good at it and then started being able to channel this consciousness which calls itself Bashar which is according to them a race of beings which are a hybrid between humanity genetics human genetics from now roughly and grey ET um, let's say genetics I don't know if that's true, but he got, he's got a very in-depth explanation as to who they are and why they're contacting us. And the short version of this is I've listened to a, probably about 500 hours of that material now. Um, I haven't listened to it for a while, but I did in the past listen to a large amount of that because I found it fascinating. And they're able to explain questions and, and communicate in a way that I've really never um, seen a human even come close to. So that alone made me want to listen to them. But um, I mean, yeah, anybody who's interested in these subjects, definitely go and look up Bashar because you'll be kept busy for a long time. Some people might think it's, uh, um, I don't know, I've heard people say that he's basically channeling a satellite and, you know, he's really just a part of a mind control agenda. It's up for you and your subjective reality to find whether or not the information they're putting out is useful or not. 50% of it I like, 50% of it I'm a bit uncomfortable with. But the, the, what I will say, though, is... Um, it's very interesting the way that they're able to explain, let's say, physics theories and, or not even theories, they, they explain physics in a way that is completely rounded and complete. So um, they won't just give you a theory, oh, we think this is how it is. You know, they'll say, no, it's like this. That This is exactly how physics works because we use it, we use it in our ships, we do this with it. Um, and, and basically until you, th their perspective is belief systems shape reality. So if you have a belief that something is true or not true, you're going to alter physical reality as a result of that, and you may not realise you've done it. And, and the example that I give to, to kind of demonstrate that is, for example, uh, let's say you have the belief that says you can't play the piano. When you come to the piano, now part of your energetic system is wired up, let's say, to pre-load um, your reality so that you have difficulty playing the piano because your energy is basically vibrating, saying, I can't play the piano. Um, and so that's it's a blockage, basically, in, in terms of healing and, and um, energetic clearing, let's say, that would be classed as a kind of a blockage. Just that belief, I can't play the piano. Whereas if you don't have that belief, you're going to have what people might call beginner's luck or, or just natural talent, they're going to say. But really all it is, you never told yourself you couldn't do it. And you're just, you know, you're, you're good friends with yourself. You, you're not kind of um, putting yourself down. You're just going to allow yourself to express and probably you're going to be okay at it. And... And that's a very simple example of a way that a belief can directly influence what happens in life or what's created in life. But they're saying it goes all the way through everything. So every belief has the capacity to change what you experience and what you draw into your reality. And it's fascinating. And, and I think basically the only way to really know whether it's true or not is to explore it for yourself. Um, and, and that, amusingly or paradoxically, means you actually have to experiment with accepting that what they're saying is true. So, you know, if you hold the belief that says that changing your beliefs won't change your reality, then it's like you're making it impossible for you to find out whether it's true that changing your beliefs will change your reality. It's, it's a bit of a head twister, but ultimately I have explored that and I have to say um, I find that there's quite a bit of truth to it. And I actually prefer now to remove all beliefs because I, I feel that beliefs basically... If I define what a belief is to myself, I say, well, it's a thought that says that another thought is true, 
without you knowing whether it's true or not. So, in other words, you're guessing, really, and that's what a belief is. So why are we basing anything on beliefs? So I try to get rid of beliefs and, and just stick with knowledge and thoughts and feelings, and that's fine for me. Um, but it's so easy to make a belief that it takes a bit of work to clear them out. Um, and for me, that's that's one of the biggest parts of healing, and that's something that I'm fairly sure humanity really needs to, to learn and focus on more more clearly, because every incorrect thought that we hold not only has the capacity for us to make poor choices but it actually also can cause physical illness as well directly causes stress um, and discomfort and lots and lots of problems so uh, I would really be happy if schools were to shift let's say to having meditation uh, certainly instead of detentions but or punishments but having meditation actual classes and I think they would find that their results skyrocketed rocketed as a result of that. Um, it's debatable whether the schooling system wants high high uh, abilities but from their students, but some hopefully do. So um, this is this is the direction that I like to take things in in general when I look for solutions is to start with the heart, start in, inside of us. And interestingly, when you do that, you realize that a lot of the ancient kind of lineages and traditions, such as yoga and I think some that predate that, really they were trying to focus on these same subjects. Um, um, and that really also brings me on to the next subject I want to briefly touch on, which takes us back to the whole subject that I was bringing up earlier on about the singularity, um, which is that you've got basically, you're either, you're either heartless to some extent, same for everyone, or you're fully heart-centered, or you're somewhere in between, and most people are somewhere in between. Uh, and on one end you've got basically psychopaths, serial killers, really kind of damaged, heartless people. On the other end, you've got maybe people who are classed as, in the past, they might have been called saints or whatever it was. Um, you know, very kind of outstanding people who are very loving, compassionate. Most people are somewhere in between. Um, the thing is, we're always creating. Every, all day long, we're creating. It just as I'm talking, I'm creating. I'm creating a new reality. I'm creating words. Um, I'm creating a conversation. So if you've got, if you're heart-centered, you're going to be creating in a heart-balanced way. If you're heartless, you're going to be creating heartless things. Um, and you can see that all around us on planet Earth. You can see almost every kind of creation has a heart-centered heart kind of version of it and a heartless version. Uh, there's a true, powerful version and there's a kind of fake version. Um, and many people have pointed out the pharma pharmaceutical industry versus natural healing or common law versus, or, tr or, or sort of older law systems versus the statute system we have in Britain that, that basically is just a pyramid system for, of control. And it goes through every single establishment where you've got the kind of real and the fake version. Um, but one, one image that's been in my mind recently quite a lot is um, the way that Las Vegas, for example, has taken, is a really good example, they, they've taken the pyramids and they've taken lots of ancient structures from around the world and they've shoved them into a space in the desert, interestingly, not too far away from Area 51. Um, and they have basically tried to sell the world on this idea that with bright flashing lights, that this is the light you need. You know, it's kind of like, uh, come to our bright flashing lights and our great mysteries of the world. And this is the best you can get on planet Earth and have a good time. What they've really done is taken an energetic grid system taken symbols and structures built from that, from really ancient, deep understandings of sacred geometry and uh, spiritual science, and they've corrupted it totally into a system which basically defrauds people of their money um, and, and just exploits people in, in so many different ways. And people really have become like moths flying to that, those lights out in the desert because they don't have any light of them in their, in their lives normally. All the light's been sucked out of life. All they're left with is TV and smartphones and... Um, you know, neon signs basically, and that's the light. <laughs> Maybe a bit of sunlight if they're lucky. So it's understandable that for them, Las Vegas seems like the best thing since sliced bread kind of thing. It's, it's going to suck them in. And what I'd like people to do is just, just take a zoom out, take a step back from that, look at that reality, look at Las Vegas, and then look at the real ancient monuments and ancient structures that, that they're copying and do some research into those. Because when you do and you, and you, and you have a really open mind, and you just keep listening to everyone that's talking about these subjects, eventually you're going to find some astonishing 
information as I have done, and I'm happy to share it, um, which completely changes your understanding of, of the history of the planet and who you are. Um, I mean, this is actually how I got started, how I came to have contact with these light ships was from studying these subjects. So if anybody out there wants to meet some visitors, let's say, then a really good place to start is studying um, sacred geometry, which is forms of geometry and maths which were classed as being sacred because of their presence in the human body and in nature and the way that they uh, those forms of mathematics create shapes which then go on to basically create pretty much all the structures in the whole universe. Um, and these, these, these forms of sacred mathematics were known by ancient people on this planet and, it's, and there's no question because they've used these maths in all, so many different structures including hundreds and thousands of different places in the pyramids in Cairo. Uh, and yet we're not taught about them in schools at all. Uh, you might hear something mentioned about the Fibonacci sequence, uh, which is related to all of this, related to the phi constant, which is uh, the golden ratio, which was used by Leonardo da Vinci and lots of other kind of masters of the arts. Um, but we, it's removed completely from our kind of mainstream academic systems. And I would say that that's not an accident at all. I would say that's that's done deliberately because if you understand the implications of these systems, these mathematical truths, uh, then you understand something about the ancient past of our planet and you realise that we didn't kind of come, strictly speaking, just from cavemen and, and became evolved to where we are now, as scientists and academics tried to tell us. Basically, at certain points in the past, humanity had very, very deep, advanced understandings of the universe. And in my opinion, we kind of, it's a bit like a ski jump. We kind of, I don't know where we were at in the dim distance past, dim and distant past, but at some point we got quite high in terms of understanding. And then cataclysms happened, problems, bad decisions, and our general consciousness level shot right down. And it's like a ski jump. And now we're kind of starting to come back up again. Now we've kind of solved some of the problems at least and we've got a whole bunch of other problems but we're learning some of these take sacred truths and they're putting us back on the right path. Some people are. So plus we also have all the technology as well which could be good or not but um, so I think uh, Las Vegas amusingly is a really good topic to focus on and just compare that to what you can learn from the ancient monuments of the planet watch a documentary called the code by carl monk on youtube which i have a version on of on my channel which has got cleaned up audio now and it's um uh, he was basically a american general i think he was military general um or colonel and when he retired he put a lot of time into studying maps and he was trying to work out a new form of coordinates a new way of creating coordinates and mapping in general and just through chance or however he did it he came he, he figured out a way of encoding a number which would give you the longitude and latitude on the planet in a particular way and when he looked at some of the old structures like pyramids and places like that he found that this code applied to those structures and the more he analyzed the structures the more he realized that they designed the structures to reflect things that he was discovering based on the, the position and these other factors that he was, these other kind of ways of working with maths that he was playing around with. Uh, and he eventually found out that they were using radians. This is a whole system of mathematics which we don't use nowadays. Um, and my knowledge of it is quite limited, but but if you watch that video, it's quite long, but you will, your, your mind will be blown. Basically, he shows how most, if not all, of the ancient giant structures on the planet were created by people using the same system of math so they were either the same people or they were all in direct communication with each other. And they were very smart, basically. And, and he, he even goes on to show how on Mars there was the whole Cydonia argument where people were saying, oh, there's a face on Mars. You can see from the, from the um, NASA images. And other people are saying, no, there's no face on Mars. It's silly. It's just shadows. Um, and someone brought out a picture which basically overlaid the Sirius star system, if I remember correctly, the, the seven sisters, I think they're called. Um, and if you if you take the layout of the brightest stars in that system and you put it on like a, a transparent piece of plastic and you overlay it on top of the pyramids on Mars, the alleged pyramids on Mars and the face on Mars, they actually match up perfectly. Um, so in other words, the, 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 he's, and he also showed that the mathematics system he identified for the pyramids on Earth also applied to those ones on Mars as well. So 
from that perspective, it, it's hard to really refute that those are actually pyramids on Mars, from my perspective, without going there. But um, but all of these things, they're all interconnected, and there's, it's really such an important topic for people to, to explore, I think, because it means you can bypass, just through using maths, basically, you can bypass a lot of the propaganda and the... Um, uh, let's say uh, lies basically uh, that are being spread about these subjects from people who want to keep us in the dark so um, you know I'm also open to being told that I'm wrong and that Karl Marx's maths are wrong or whatever if you want to do that go for it um, I'm always open to being told I'm wrong because it means I'm getting closer to the truth if I really am wrong so um, but this really brings me on to the last kind of topic I want to raise with regards to all this kind of UFO ancient culture um, subjects, I think. And it was really this subject that really awoke me the most uh, prior to my first encounter with the lightship. And it's a book by um, uh, an author who, I'm actually having trouble remembering his name, but he's almost unheard of. Um, but he wrote a book called The Star Mirror. And I kind of found it by synchronicity during this period. And it has a foreword by Robert Bavau, who's quite well known. And I actually spoke to him on Facebook about this, about this book, because I wanted to know why more people didn't know about it. And he basically just ignored me, you know, was, if I remember correctly. He certainly didn't give me, you know, a helpful answer. But um, in short, this book appears to show that um, there are certain constellations above our planet which have, or let's say certain... Um, shapes of stars which are um, triangles we, where all the sides of the triangles are the same length so it's like a perfect triangle and where those stars align uh, if you rotate the earth I think I'm right in saying it was a long time since I read the book but if you rotate the earth back in time so that it's everything's aligned as it was thousands of years ago at the time the pyramid was created in Cairo so that the pyramids in Cairo line up with Orion's belt um, so you've got a, a time stamp basically and you know that that's the time when it was made because that's when it all lines up perfectly to within a tiny tiny measurement of a degree uh, then if you look at these sets of stars which are triangles you can map those onto the earth and you'll find that basically there are either three mountains perfectly aligned with those stars or in some cases there's two highest mountains in in that in that in that area in whichever area it is the two highest mountains will be two of the points on the on the triangle of stars and the third one will be an ancient structure like a it could be a pyramid or a temple or something like that um and that's what this book is basically about and it shows you that quite clearly um i mean it's, I, I have to say preface this with i haven't gone through and mathematically checked all of this i tried to it's quite a lot of work and one day i will do very interested to hear from people who may have read this book or done research into this but it very much appeared to me that uh, basically the stars are very much connected to the structure of the earth and the ancient people knew that and they understood it and they built structures to reflect that and their purpose for doing that I can only speculate but at this point it certainly is a very eye-opening lesson for us right now because it teaches us things that we've forgotten or just don't have a clue about so I've gone on a very big journey from believing what science told me when I was younger that we're just random pieces of meat walking around on a rock floating in space by complete chance uh, to actually everything is designed and created to some extent um, unless people are going to claim that mountains spring up over time as a result of the magnetic field of stars pulling on them or something like that which maybe um, I don't know but it certainly seems to me that there's a definite order and kind of intelligence behind the um, the geometries and the structure of our solar system at the very least so that that was when I really opened my eyes when I learned that and, and it was shortly after that I started having these wilder experiences let's say so um, rather than paying someone to take you out into field into a field and meditate and look up at this up at the heavens maybe you can study what's on the ground first and uh, and come to it through your heart, basically through the earth heart, which is what I'm kind of pointing at the whole time. Um, this is our home, so we should probably make friends with our home and treat it a bit better than we do. Yeah, I think you've still got a couple of other things to show, uh, if you want to just go for those. Sure, yeah, one. yeah. I mean, 
I've got these slides here, which which really just reflect. Obviously, I mean, most people have seen this before. Um, if we compare that, the Egyptian um, Sphinx and pyramids in the background. Uh, obviously, we could talk about I mean, just. Have you actually have you been there actually? Yeah, I mean, that in itself is an interesting story. Um, I went there when I was about thirteen with my school, and we walked through. Didn't actually go into the pyramids. We walked around them, but I remember we went into the Cairo Museum and basically that was my first paranormal experience that i remember because we walked past um i remember there was a an exhibit that it was they i don't i don't really know if their interpretation of what we were looking at was accurate or not but it was a very large wooden box covered in gold leaf very large and lots of statues around it i remember as i walked past that towards tutankhamun's um, headdress room basically i felt something enter me um, very quickly like a field of energy but it felt like a person not maybe not a person I guess you would call it a spirit basically something of that nature an energetic entity moved into me and didn't come out and and I was just kind of what was that um, but it was I had an understanding intuitively I could, it, it, it wasn't like I had no idea what it was it, it sort of came with the understanding oh that's a piece of spirit I had no reference point for that I'd never met anyone talking about anything like that um you know i watched ghostbusters when i was a kid but that's about it pretty much um so i don't really necessarily know what that was but that was my first paranormal experience and it definitely opened my eyes to what's possible um so i mean i have studied egypt and the history and the timelines quite a lot now and i'm firmly of the understanding that egypt was formed by some of the survivors from atlantis uh, after Atlantis was kind of destroyed and you know if you'd have talked to me when I was about 18 and told me I'd be saying this at this age I would have laughed because I just I would never have accepted that Atlantis was real but um, having now done quite a lot of research and and also into some past life things and met lots of people who are also aware of some of their past lives I'm 90% sure that Atlantis was real and um, there's very good sources very good books for information on that which still most people aren't aware of um, so I think basically that ex my understanding is that the, the the most impressive pyramids in Egypt actually the oldest which is the opposite to what the Egyptologists talk about often um, they kind of have the idea that they probably start the builders started out not being very good at it and they got better over time and that's you know that's how that works but my understanding is actually m much like the ski jump idea I was talking about the earlier ones were built with a very deep understanding of sacred geometry and of vibrational science and other spiritual sciences which allowed them to to make them basically i mean it's pretty hard to make a pyramid like that obviously um, and then as time went on they for whatever reason they lost the understandings maybe it was corrupted maybe they got too addicted to power i don't know but um they eventually forgot how to build good pyramids is what it comes down to and so they ended up making the kind of weaker ones that that Egyptologists often claim are the oldest. Um, yeah, I mean, I could talk about this for a very long time. I think um, I, there are so many interesting ancient cultures and most of the most interesting ones don't get talked about. That Talking about ancient Egypt feels a little bit um, of a distraction to me in a way, but um, I think a lot of the South American and African cultures are very misrepresented and misunderstood. By it's, example, what type? Uh, well, an interesting person to to study or listen to in, in about that is uh, Michael Tellinger, um, South African, uh, I think he's an archaeologist, who runs the political party, the Ubuntu party. Um, definitely check out some of his videos. He he, um, he basically started looking at the um, ancient stoneworks in Africa and in his in his kind of area and and found very interesting stuff i mean he, he, there, there was one area circles millions of circles yeah and and he was showing how it was related to the magnet magnetron in like an electromagnetic device basically the layout of these structures was it formed a similar pattern to what's used in microwaves now uh and he was he was showing how there's lots of stones on the ground you'd find there that which were tuned so if you bang them they make a perfect resonant tone uh and he was speculating that they were using these stones to channel energy and vibrations and frequencies um, which I can fully accept as being real. Uh, so, and, and I've also met lots of people, well, a few people who have lived with uh, and met 
some of the tribes like the Dogon tribe are quite well known now, for example, who they're the people in in Africa who who basically say that they come from the star Sirius star system Sirius and Yeah, before before I meant to know about it being two the twin system. Yeah. And and you know they're, they're, and also so there's a few tribes like that. There, there's a very good video um, with a Mayan shaman or, or elder who came to Britain, and he went to one of the universities, and some astro specialist from the university sh was showing him a picture of stars taken from the Hubble telescope, and I think this the English guy or European guy basically thought that this jungle dwelling guy was a bit kind of simple basically, and he was like. They didn't. They didn't share a same language, so they had a translator, and um, and he showed him the star map or picture, and and as as the translator was explaining what was going on, the European guy was kind of looking at him like he was a four-year-old and saying stars, stars, kind of like that, and 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 the Mayan guy just immediately starts bl blathering in his language and and basically he's saying, oh yeah, that's that star, that's that star, that's that. Uh, no, that's it. No, sorry. There's only one star, in, one star in the whole in the whole picture, and he picked it out straight away. There's lots of other objects in in the scene, but no other stars. I think I'm right saying that. Um, and he picked it out straight away, and he named it, and he said, oh yeah, that's this in our language, but we can't normally see that from Earth. And and the guy's sort of j jaw hit the floor, and basically he was like, "Yeah, you, we didn't know about it until we had the Hubble telescope." Uh, and <laughs> so basically, he's shown that they had knowledge of this um, this um, space object, let's say, um, in a way that they couldn't have had just through looking through the naked eye, and they didn't have the Hubble telescope. So there's been a few examples like that that you can find on YouTube, even where it really just blows away the idea that these tribes are kind of unevolved, um, spiritually illiterate beings. They're not at all. They're very, very powerful, very wise often. Um, and I think the European kind of blood lust that destroyed a lot of them in years gone by is really one of the biggest tragedies that the Earth's ever had because it forced them to hide their wisdom and it also forced... Um, them to suffer a lot as well. So basically, humanity is much worse off for what Europeans did to those cultures. And yeah, mass genocide, destruction of high knowledge. But by who? Who's really behind that? My understanding of that is that, in essence, it's quite simple. Uh, it's complicated, but there's you can view it in a simple way. If you look at the chakra system, the traditional chakra system, the energy centers of the body, which when I first started studying them, I didn't really know if they were real or not. But again, I looked at it with an open mind. And I'd studied martial arts before. I'd seen people do very unusual things with energy, which I would have thought was impossible, but I saw them do it. Um, so I was quite open to studying these things. And in essence, what I've been shown is that uh, the upper chakras above the heart, which would be um, the throat, the third eye, center of the brain, pineal gland, and the crown, uh, they are, let's say, masculine centers, and they're more spirit-oriented. So when people say they're a spiritual person or they pray or they do these kind of spiritual practices, basically, typically, they're more focusing in these upper energy centers. If they are more, let's say, body oriented and they may, you know, they like to dance a lot, jump around, they're more emotional, like traditionally, you know, tribes in Africa and let's say the jungle and other places have been seen to be, um, they're more in the feminine centers. So they're more in the root and uh, um, sacral and the solar plexus center. And these are red coloured and the upper ones are blue coloured. And in the middle you've got the heart, which is green, or some people say pink, but it's the balancing point, basically, is the heart. And what seems to have happened is some cultures have gone off and heavily focused into the lower chakra end, end of things, and some cultures have gone off and focused heavily into the upper chakra side of things. So you've got the European kind of way of being, which is very technology-oriented, very mind-oriented, very masculine, um, and then and not so emotional and then you've got the more kind of african south american other aboriginal kind of cultures they don't really develop technology so much now you know in our recorded history but they're very bodily usually very strong and you know they're genetically well adapted to the planet they're not gonna you know get too damaged going out in the sun and things like that like us kind of cave dwelling europeans um and in essence there's a big kind of conflict on the planet between those groups and we know that from the fact that they've been fighting for so long basically and there's i mean if you look at the christian kind of domination of those groups 
in the past, they would try and justify it by saying, oh, well, these people are from the devil and, um, you know, God basically is telling us to rid the world of them uh, because they're not living in the way that the Bible or whatever book it is says that they should be living and they're worshipping X, Y, Z and so on. But yes, there was imbalance in, in those, in all the cultures had some degrees of imbalance and I'm not trying to say that Aztec, you know, ritual sacrifice was a good thing, but the point is that every culture has something to offer and if you destroy a culture you're missing you're going to be losing something important from humanity and and i think your question about who is it that's responsible for targeting these groups basically from my perspective it's heartless beings first of all who are very anti-emotion they're very anti-femininity they're very anti um the body basically so um you know if you look at let's say some of the well-known religions they often have preached that the body is, you know, the work of the devil and um, basically, you know, even in yoga they teach often that you must transcend your lower energy centers. They even talk about lower chakras. You must, you know, remove yourself from your lower chakras. They're, they're the animal version of you. They're the bad part. But in reality, those centers are your survival centers. They're like the core of your ability to exist in, in a physical body at all. So um, if you try to cut those out, you die basically um and that's what we see is when when that's why this keeps being played out over and over and over again on planet earth is spirit oriented beings mind oriented beings targeting these more body oriented beings and saying they're bad and trying to kill them um and what's going to happen if they succeed is we're all going to die basically because we need those those their wisdom and their memory and their cultural heritage and their and their emotionality and their genetics, we need all of those for us to survive as humans at all. Uh, so much beyond just not becoming cyborgs, <laughs> we also need to be, um, I would say, becoming much more body conscious and much more allowing our minds to connect with our body and to become a complete human being, um, which in energetic terms basically means all of our chakras are balanced, um, which I would also point out is something you can't do just by crystals or tones or um, rituals or anything like that due to the nature of the chakras because the lower chakras are emotional they're not gonna your emotions don't change just because you know completely just because you come into contact with a crystal or a sound or something like that you actually have to be emotional and that's where your vibrational power comes from so the more emotional you are the more passionate you are the more powerful you are basically the stronger you're going to be the quicker your body's going to heal and and interestingly this is this really does kind of summarize clearly the situation most of us certainly in britain and western cultures are walking around with a lot of emotional baggage a lot of um, fear anger resentment um, pain guilt and a lot of issues like this which need to be healed but we're not conscious of them because we've chosen not to feel those feelings we've we're holding the belief that says Anger is bad, anger is dangerous, you know, anger needs to be managed. So therefore, we shouldn't have anger. And if we do have anger, we're going to control it and suppress it and everything will be fine and we'll walk around pretending we're happy. Uh, and then we're driving down the motorway and get angry and stab someone in the throat, you know. <laughs> That's pretty much the origin of, of road rage and probably a lot of murders and probably wars as well, is all of this emotional compression and stifling and denial that builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up and then it can't be held back anymore it becomes like a volcano and it will always find a vent somewhere where it can come out in in life and it might make no sense at all what happens you know many murders and things like that are, are, are done with no real rational explanation but if you understand that it's um an emotional kind of reaction to denial then it starts to make a bit more sense and i would say that some people that i know have, have said that tourette syndrome for example is actually an example of that as well where um, you're not the person is not allowed to be angry they're not their mind is not allowing them to be angry but they do know that they're allowed to swear you know it's like sometimes it's funny to swear so they'll swear and then that's accepted and then oh there's Tourette syndrome so I can just keep swearing I'm not meaning to put these people down I'm just saying maybe it would we would learn a lot by helping those people to process their emotions and maybe they might find they they can find greater peace through expressing anger in a, a natural organic way uh, and that's something that i've done myself for a long time 
and I actually had to spend about six months pretty much in bed um, <laughs> because I had so much anger built up inside of me and fear because I had, a, I had a near fatal car crash and lots of other things which made me very angry in life and and I never really I'd always suppressed it like my, my grandfather was in World War II um, and he, he was destroyed basically by his own emotional compression and, and denial he would never be emotional um, and he obviously was very angry and upset by what happened during during the war. He lost all his friends, and I saw that and realized, you know, wow, I I could feel it really. I could feel that that's what was happening to him, and I realized, well, I have to learn about this. I have to not do that. Basically, I have to not I have to evolve and and not end up the same way. And so, having had very good um, uh, resources to help me learn how to do this, I spent about six months, as I said, in bed, pretty much just feeling the feeling in my body and then not controlling it and then allowing my body to make sounds and movements in whatever needed to come out and that might be punching the bed or screaming or crying or shaking whatever I needed to do um, and all, interestingly all of those things all of those let's say expressions and behaviors they're the ones which we're told are you know only crazy people do those uh, you'll be going to a mental hospital if you do that um, you must be crazy and if you think about it it's not crazy to be angry and it's not crazy to be afraid so where does all these judgments come from and that's really the problem we've heavily judged our real emotions to the point where we've become emotionally crippled and and therefore anybody who kind of doesn't do that anybody who is emotionally free it's got to the point where the people that run the societies basically make the key decisions view those people and say wow they're they're the complete opposite of what they should be. They're crazy. Look at them. They're, they're running around dancing, and you know, <laughs> that's not right. And and that, I mean, if you look at like, it sounds silly in a way, but like the movie Zulu with Michael Caine, you know, the the kind of Zulu war that, that that was talking about, that was kind of how they saw it. You know, it was like they were very kind of stiff upper lip, you know, greasing their moustaches and um, and falling in line and. God save the Queen and all this stuff and basically just going out and shooting people who were semi-naked mainly because they were semi-naked plus they wanted to steal all the, all the land obviously but um, uh, yeah so interestingly that segues into the next topic that I want to talk about which is um, a guy called Carol Quigley um, who some people may have heard of who basically was a historian um, he was an Ivy League historian I think in the 1960s and um, to cut a long story short, he was very well respected and he was a professor, I think. And he somehow got to know certain, people's in certain people in certain secret societies who commissioned him to write a book based on their own private records, their secret records. And the story goes that he wasn't meant to publish that book. It was meant to be just for their own use and he wrote it over a period of about two years. And somehow the book got published and it came out, I think, by Penguin. And after a few months, it was, was withdrawn when obviously the people involved realized he'd done this. But the thing was, it was such a massive book that it was just way beyond what most people were ever going to read. So even though he released a bunch of these group secrets, most people never read it because it was only about apparently about 5% of this massive book had this kind of dynamite information in it. The rest of it was very dry historical documentation of events so it's taken decades for people to actually really get to grips with what he wrote about and if you are familiar with James Corbett on YouTube the Corbett report he's covered this in quite some depth and he did an interview with a guy called Joe Plummer who wrote his own book based on Carol Quigley's book um, and he basically went through and took out the most important parts of that book and made it easily accessible and you can read that book for free. It's called, I think it's called Tragedy and Hope 101, if I remember correctly. And in short, what he shows is that uh, these people designed democracy. The whole idea of democracy was basically designed and co-opted by them almost from day one to be nothing more than a theatre act to make sure that the, the people of the planet basically think that they're having a say in what's being done when in reality they aren't. And I think most of us know that that's what's happening, but but when you actually see it documented and you see the plan and you read about who who the people were, how they managed to do it, 
it really does fill in a lot of the puzzle pieces and the, the reason this is connected to what I was just talking about is that apparently according to Carol Quigley um, the character who started all of this was um, Cecil Rhodes who um, uh, basically the country Rhodesia was named after and who started the Rhodes Foundation and you have the famous like Rhodes Scholars people who get into top universities in England as a result of the money from his kind of let's say philanthropy um, but what this book tells the story of is in essence that he through their plundering of Africa um, basically took the wealth of an entire continent um, and kind of squirreled it away into his funds and so on and he was I mean it's almost uncalculable the amount of wealth that he had in today's money but when he died he left a variety of wills and the general message in the wills, uh, the ones that were, let's say, more secret, was that his vast wealth was to be used to create a secret society, which he'd already started before he died. Uh, and it was, in short, the, the idea was he thought that English white men were the best people on planet Earth and therefore English white men should rule the whole planet. And the idea was that they would use this massive wealth to make that happen. And they kind of did, basically, or they, they you know, they certainly had a go. And... Um, so it was run out of a uh, particular, I think it was an Oxford University or kind of um, a similar sort of educational um, establishment there. And they would pick the what they could consider to be the smartest people of the time to go into the secret society. It had all these different layers. It had like an inner circle, an outer circle, and the outer circle didn't know what the inner circle was doing. Um, and in short, a lot of the world's biggest, wealthiest families or the wealthiest families um, that we still know about today um, where you know some of them have place, places named after them you know they're very well known gave billions of dollars into this fund to try to subjugate the rest of the world in the name of kind of anglo-saxon dominance um, yeah so that definitely is a massive part of our problems because those people are still running things today basically they're still running the biggest corporations they're still um, running governments and they're still killing millions of people and they don't really care about don't i don't think they even really care about who wins to be honest i think all they care about is lots of people die and um their bank balance goes up pretty much um and i think they see themselves as farmers of of planet human humanity in a way planet earth and it's their job to make sure everyone gets corralled into the right fields and uh, the population doesn't get too high and they stay at the top of the pyramid um I wouldn't want to go much beyond that because it would be speculation. You know, I'm not going to start saying they're ruled by reptilians like David Icke or anything like that. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, but according to one of the most respected historians from the last century, this stuff is real. And um, what can I say? Basically, you can still buy those his original books republished now. They weren't available for a long time. Uh, another one that he published, I think it's called The Anglo-American Establishment, which I'm partway through reading. Um, so that's definitely another topic which I recommend people research who are interested in all these things. Um, so again, if you ask who, who's responsible for all this stuff, basically it's humans. Uh, it's just heartless humans. And um, the, the kind of root cause of that, as I understand it, is a lack of self-acceptance. So if you don't accept yourself, then you're always going to be trying to get things to bolster your poor self-image, let's say, inside yourself from outside so you can have the biggest house the biggest car you know the most makeup covered trophy wife the biggest country named after you whatever it is you're going to be doing those things um which you wouldn't even think about doing if you were completely accepting yourself you'd be thinking you know if you loved yourself you had a good internal relationship with yourself in a sense you just wouldn't care about those things you'd just be interested in having fun feeling good being creative doing what you want to do without harming anyone else but if you hate yourself, basically, then there's nothing stopping you hating other people en masse. And if you don't love yourself, then you definitely aren't going to be loving other people. And that puts you in a position where you are opening the door to you doing things which are highly destructive. Um, the, and you're going to probably convince yourself that what you're doing is great. You know, like you're, you're a superhero. You're, you're going to just fabricate a whole bunch of stuff. Like, a bit like Adolf Hitler with his whole Superman ideology and... Um, the idea that of the master race and all this stuff it's all just total fabrication but it's there to justify what he wants to do which i don't really want to speculate what exactly what he was doing but 
The point is that mentality definitely is prevalent in way too many people, in my opinion. Um, and I think the world would be a lot better off if we collectively understood that and kind of helped each other to um, value ourselves more highly than we've been taught to. Uh, it's, it took me a long time to undo the programming that I picked up at school and later, which basically said, I'm in England, so we have our own phraseology for things, but um, we have the phrase big headed uh, or you're full of yourself. And if someone comes along and, you know, they're confident, then people would sort of say behind their back, oh, he's, he's full of himself, you know, he's big headed. But really, I mean, yeah, you can be you can be imbalanced and you can put other people down and, and try to pretend and posture that you're confident. But if you really are confident, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. It means that you're actually, you know, you're quite happy and um, empowered in some way. And that's a good thing. But we lost, certainly amongst my friends when we were growing up, we had no real concept of that and, and everything got reversed. And, and that's really what heartlessness is. It's when you take something good and you reverse it and it becomes the opposite of what it should be. So confidence becomes something that's bad and you shouldn't have it. Uh, and wealth even, you know, is inherently bad to some people. But without wealth, you know, there's, you're quite limited in what you can do. And so we need to be very clear about what is the real version, the good balanced version and the fake. The fake version, much like Vegas versus the ancient monuments. And that, that's where feelings come in again. So I keep going back to that, but it's possible for us to feel what's loving and what's not loving. And that's the key to all of this. Um, and that's why I'm so alarmed by the AI robotic thing, because they're trying to suggest that AI is going to solve all our problems and give us the answers to all our questions. Um, even some people that, that I've seen talking about this who really seem to be quite clued up about a lot of things are actually openly saying, well, we're going to use AI to answer spiritual questions. And I'm kind of thinking, well, no, you aren't. <laughs> you're going to you're going to get answers which are heartless, which lead you in the wrong direction. So, um, yeah, I think. I think you've got another picture to show. Yeah, the next picture, the last one is uh, this is Las Vegas. So you you get an idea of what I'm talking about. Very shiny, very kind of impressive penis phallic kind of symbol there, of the <laughs> on the right. Um, lux or lux means light in Latin. So basically, it's a big pillar with the word light on it um, and with the big pyramid behind it and all these recreations of the mysteries of the world. And they're not going to teach you anything about the mysteries of the world. They're basically just going to suck you in and with bright flashing lights and using their decades of research into the brain and into human psychology, they're going to understand, for example, that the human brain is highly focused towards visual processing so they're going to overload your visual senses with bright lights and sounds and women in underwear and stuff and basically completely distract you and get you excited and stimulated and then they're going to take all your money. Um, and I think I like to... Another another topic that I really like is words and language. I know a lot of people like to study the etymology of, of our language and find out why we're saying what we're saying and I think that's a good thing to research. You can learn a lot from that. Um, and that's actually a subject that I am writing a book about. Um, but I just want to say, for, as an example, you can find a lot of these patterns. There's a lot of very interesting patterns when you look at the words that are used to name places on Earth. So America, for example, A-M, uh, I can't even spell America, A-M-E-R-I-C-A -E um, is an anagram of I am race. So I am race. All right, well, I am is a very kind of well-known spiritual phrase. Basically, it's like the core statement that you exist race meaning groups of people racing each other basically and fighting and competing um, on our planet anyway the way that it's taught so I am race well how does America relate to the idea of I am race well that's kind of the whole history of America is basically lots of people coming along beating their chest shouting and declaring that they exist and then fighting each other based on racial kind of stereotypes and borders that's hundreds of years worth of history that's what's been happening there so I noticed that and I was thinking, well, that's interesting. And then I started looking at all these different other countries and finding similar patterns. And, and when you look at Las Vegas, it becomes a little bit esoteric and, you know, you can use your imagination here, but um, you need to read my book basically to, to, to fully understand where I'm coming from with this. But um, Vegas, V-E-G-A-S, um, backwards, look at it backwards. It's sage with a V on the end. And a V is a symbol of a mirror or a reflection. And reflections are very significant within my way of thinking about things. Um, so 
sage means wise and it means you know basically you're a kind of respectful respected respected person in community who um in the community who who knows a lot and you're able to make good decisions so what's the opposite of sage well it would be unwise uh and they've even even in the letter v at the start of vegas they're showing you there's a reflection here so what do we get when we reflect the word? We see sage. So it's basically, I don't know whether this was done deliberately or not, but I know these groups do like to play around with words and encodings and things. It's interesting. I don't know if it's deliberate or not, but however you look at it, it basically is encoded in there. It's like the name of it is showing you this is the opposite of intelligent. This is the opposite of wise. That's what Vegas is. Um, and the fact that they've got Luxor there just blatantly as well, bringing light into it as well. As many people have pointed out, these groups definitely do like to throw things in our faces, um, hidden in plain sight. And it, I think, you know, I don't know if they always do it deliberately even, but I think there's definitely an element of this where they're kind of challenging you to, it's like they think they're much smarter than you, so therefore they're leaving you a little clue, a little breadcrumb to try and trigger your mind to think like they think, because they think they think better than everyone else. So if they can show you you know, a little bit of how they think, then you're going to be, you know, they've helped you, they've done a good deed while they're robbing you blind. Maybe that's me being a bit cynical, but I, I've seen this a lot, and I, I think there's definitely an element of that to it. Um, so, yeah, uh, I mean, I don't, we could talk for days and days and days, or I could talk anyway, about, about America and the government. And well, how do you want to close then? Uh, I think I'd like to just... <sighs> Remind people that you are loved and you have the power that you need inside of you if you actually take the time to stop looking in your cell phone, stop watching TV, um, go out into nature, meditate, feel the planet, um, open your mind and actually feel more. If you're willing to do all those things, clean up your diet, remove the junk from your diet, stop buying the corporate products, basically live a natural life. If you're able to do all those things, which everyone probably can, um, you're going to solve a lot of your problems. A lot of the problems that you think that you have, they're not real problems. You don't, they're, not, they're not even relevant to you. They'll, they'll, you won't be worried about those once you've solved some of your other problems, which tend to stem from polluted body, um, brain, and mind as a result of countless toxins, countless impurities introduced into our environment from the water pollution, the air pollution, food pollution, GMOs, all these different things. Really, my, my really strong suggestion is to remember who you are, um, find what you personally need to be empowered, and don't give up, and uh, just understand that you're a divine being. You're a divine creative spirit, basically, who's an extension of the energy that created the whole universe, and the energy that created the universe didn't do it so that you could sit in an office throwing bits of paper around and basically just trying to make digits in a computer get bigger so that you can have more money you know we, we come from if you if you believe in science then we come from the big bang and that wasn't the big bank so um <laughs> if you can sort of remember that in your daily life and take little steps here and there to become a bit more free and less reliant on these um controlling pyramid systems and more in your heart then you're going to enjoy life more and uh, i'll see you there basically um, you're welcome to come to my website which is eureka.org u-r-e-k-a.org um, it's a social network which I created and I'm constantly evolving it and it's basically intended to support free will healing, balancing and evolving and um, try to control people or manipulate in no way people's thoughts you know, as far as is possible within the legal frameworks we have to operate within um, obviously we're not going to allow obviously criminal things to happen on there um, but basically it's there to try and help us heal and and not sell you things there's no adverts on there and yeah just come along and join in say hello and on top of that i might be adding in at some point soon something like steam it so you'll actually be able to be paid on there if you want to for posting um, so hopefully together we can uh, improve and uh, make life more enjoyable I think that's where I'd like to leave it. Well, thank you. You're a soul. Thank you, Miles. <laughs>